Well, Professor Ellis is here tonight. It makes me very nervous, but I think I'll survive. Thank you. Okay, so, so, so tonight we're going to go further into this controversy of whether we glorified apes or not. And if we have 99% of an ape genome, what are we? Oh, the lights. So there's this man called Nick Humphrey who wrote this foreword in Folk Physics for Apes. He says, one of the most cherished assumptions of contemporary psychology is that there is no fundamental difference between ape minds and human minds, okay? But you ought to bear in mind that all the potential for learning, thinking, and feeling that distinguishes humans from other animals lies in the information contained in the DNA of the fertilized ovum. So you have a sperm cell and an egg cell and a fertilized egg. Sperm, egg cell, fertilized egg, and then you get cell division and proliferation. Now, sperms and eggs only have 23 chromosomes each, but when they combine to form the fertilized egg, they have the full complement of 23 pairs, 23 from your father and 23 from your mother, of chromosomes like in somatic cells. Now, this is Steven Pinker of Harvard, and Pinker says that in his book, The Blank Slate, which is a worthwhile read, that chimpanzees brought up in a human home do not think, speak, or act like people because the information in the 10 megabytes of DNA that differ between us. Two species of chimpanzees, common chimps and bonobos, differ in a few tenths of 1% of their genomes, differ in many ways in their behavior. So the slight difference can cause enormous differences in behavior. Chimps are aggressive, males dominate, sex for procreation, bonobos are peaceful, females dominate, sex for recreation. So small differences in genes lead to large differences in behavior through size and shape of different parts of the brain, wiring, neurotransmitter, and hormone release, right? So this whole business about we share so much of the ape genome with the apes doesn't carry much weight when it comes to being human. Now, this is the 21st century, the age of genetics and the neurosciences, okay? And this whole business of, are you your brain? I mean, this is, is, this is the controversy. Are you a brain? This is part of that whole philosophy of physicalism or materialism. And the story started in 1848. Did any of you hear, hear of Phineas Gage? Okay, so the story started in 1848 in Cavendish, Vermont, in New England, and I think this was the turning point in this debate. I first read about it in 1979 in Colin Blakemore's books, The Mechanics of the Mind. This man, Gage, this is Colin Blakemore, this man, Gage, who was working in a quarry, blasting rock, had a rod that went through his, che his cheek and came out on the other side through his head and through his skull. Now, there's a whole lot of stories about him and what happened next, okay? Now, the rod apparently went through his forebrain. And people like Antonio Damasio and others have spoken about this remarkable story of Phineas Gage in a book called Descartes Era. Now, Descartes was a 17th century philosopher who told us that I think, therefore I am. So we have a duality, a mind-brain duality. Mr. Kaji, you better listen carefully because you asked me this question the other day. Now, this 25-year-old construction foreman goes from riches to rag, rags. He apparently went to the doctor. He walked around. He, he was quite independent. The doctor's name was Harlow, and he said, Dr. Harlow, could you remove this rod that's going through my head? through my cheek and through my head. But his personality was about to change. His disposition, his likes and dislikes, his dreams and aspirations are all to change. Gage's body may be alive and well, but there is a new spirit animating him, okay? Now, 
What a boost this was for materialists, because they said, there you are. You interfere with the brain, which is a lump of meat, which is material, which is tissue. You change anything in the brain, and you change your behavior. And this was the tamping iron that injured Phineas Gage, and it's in the Museum of the Medical College at Harvard University in the United States. Okay? Now, what, what happened since then is this debate continued. Is the mind something different from the brain? Or does the mind, is the mind a product of the brain? Or is it a completely separate feature? Now, there is a man called John Gray, and he started this raging debate. And I happened to read his book while I was sitting in a bookshop in Cambridge. But I didn't buy it, and I regret that. He's a professor, professor of European thought at London School of Economics. And he says that Darwin has shown us that we are animals and our nature has been fashioned in the bloodbath that is the natural world. Modern humanism has created a gulf between us and other animals, deluding us into believing that we can free ourselves from the limits that frame the lives of other animals. Or a faith through our science, humanity can know the truth. But if Darwin's theory of natural selection is true, the human mind serves evolutionary success, not truth. Human beings are helpless. Progress is a myth. Freedom a fantasy. Selfhood a delusion. Morality a sickness. Illusion is our natural condition. Now, that would provoke anybody. Okay. Now, when I was a student, when I was an undergrad, and we did zoology, all living things were classified into seven categories. There was the domain, and we spoke on Monday about eukaryotic cells that were our cellular precursors. We were placed in the kingdom of animals, kingdom animalia, right? Our phylum was chordata. The oldest, that means we had backbone, we have backbones. Oldest vertebrate fossil is about 560 million years old from the Cambrian period. The class was mammalia. We breastfeed our young 200 million years ago in the early Jurassic. Our order was primates. Proto-primates are about 60 million years ago in the Cenozoic area. That's when they appeared. Family hominidae. Genus Homo. Remember Homo habilis, described by Philip Tobias? Homo sapiens, eventually, 200,000 years ago. And the species is Homo sapiens sapiens. That's us, and that is the migrant group that left this continent 70,000 years ago to colonize the world. But now things have changed. That was the tree-based body plan. Okay. Now it's changed because we're in the era of modern genetics. Okay. And at this point, we talk about a sub-kingdom of protostomes and deuterostomes. Okay. Now these molecular comparisons haven't changed the classification very much, but has brought some very interesting changes um, in, 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 in living things. And I've been showing you. I've been showing you this, this. I'm sorry about this, and I know it's, it's not the perfect thing to do. I've been showing you this tree of life, which is based on a genetic classification. And your eukaryotic cells are down here. And these two sub-kingdoms, sorry. Nicholas, you want to you hold this up from behind, and then I can show I know it's very hard, but you're welcome to look at this later. It's a BBC um, poster. So the you. The two sub-kingdoms are deuterostomes and protostomes. The protostomes diverge, and they give rise to a whole lot of little animals. And the deuterostomes are us going right up in the tree and eventually ending up here. But there's some very interesting features here. This is 4 billion years. This is a silocant. I'm re reading a book by, by Mike, uh, Mike Bruton, I think it is, The Fishy Smiths. And they discovered the silicant, which is 400 million years old. Who would have thought that the hippo is so closely related to the whale? And of course, we're very closely related to Pan Paniscus, 
or the chimp. And I just want you to note, I'm not going to hold this up any longer, but I just want you to note that here we've got an octopus, because when we speak about consciousness tomorrow, there is something to do, to, to do there's something to talk about in terms, in relation to the octopus. But this is a lovely chart, but what I'm saying is that the old classification was fine, except for a few different features, but it's based on genetic sequences. And Richard Dawkins, thanks Nicholas, Richard Dawkins has said, and it's a statement I don't like, he says, you can do away with all the fossils in the, on the earth now. Don't look for them anymore. We can classify uh, life through our knowledge of genetics. Thanks. Okay. So, I just want to talk about this. This animal kingdom is divided into two great sub-kingdoms, Deuterostomia and Protostomia. And, and, and it happens at the stage of gastrulation. And somebody, I think it was Lewis Wolpert, the scientist who said, it is not birth, marriage, or death, but gastrulation, which is truly the most important time in your life. In the deeps of geological time, and increasingly deprived of the hard support of fossils, we rely on genetic sequences to classify organisms. That's Richard Dawkins from the Ancestors' Tale. Now, I just want to point out to you that the protostomes and the deuterostomes don't look very different at the eight cell stage, okay? But the difference is here. When you have the formation of this cavity because of more cells appearing, right, you get a, 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 an opening here called the blastopore. Now, in, in that, in that, uh, in that protostomes, in those protostomes, the, the, the mouth develops from the blastospore, but the anus develops on the other end. In the deuterostomes, the eight cell stage looks the same, but the anus develops from the blastopore. So the difference is that in this case, the mouth develops from the blastopore, and in our case, the anus develops from the blastopore. So the deuterostomes also show indeterminate development in which each of the cells of the eight cell embryo if separated, remain capable of developing as complete organisms. When this protostome starts dividing from the fertilized egg, every cell is actually dedicated towards making the protostome, whatever that animal is. I showed it to you on the left branch of that tree. But in the deuterostomes, you can take any one of these eight cells and it could develop into a fully-fledged living organism. Okay, so that was the tree that I showed you. Now, Terry Eagleton, the professor of English literature at Lancaster University, he said, Gray is talking nonsense. His rant is a symptom, not a solution. He, he is, don't worry about it. He is not even a nihilist, because that would imply some hope that the world could be redeemed from meaninglessness. It takes a degree of heroic perversity to overlook every apparent flicker of human value. If morality is a fiction, then why does Gray morally denounce everything? Remember, we and not giraffes commit genocide. Our capacity is to annihilate each other lie close to those which allow us to die for each other, compose magnificent symphony, symphonies, produce the greatest works of literature, send probes to distant planets. So there's something about being human. Okay? But the man who was really, really angry with Gray was Raymond Tallis. And he vented his anger in this book, Aping Mankind. Now, Tallis is a philosopher, he's a poet, he's a novelist, he's a cultural critic, and he's a retired medical physician and clinical neuroscientist at the University of Manchester. And everybody there knows who Tallis is. They say when he drives in in his Rolls Royce, and his red hat, you know, Talus is around. Okay, now, when he says, when you talk about this question, what it means to be human, then you go to evolutionary theory and the neurosciences, right? So, he was for a long time the emeritus professor of gerontology at Manchester, okay? And gerontology is the neurology of the aged. He's a polymath, okay? He's an atheist, a secularist who 
hates materialistic interpretations of the mind, which I found very interesting. The other thing he believes, and this is, this is absolutely fascinating, he believes that consciousness is not in the brain. And I'll tell you a little bit about it just now. And he has a distaste for biologism. And this is what he says. To explain what it is to be human, Thales makes a diversion from mainstream materialistic thinking. He says, biologism, our modern malady, says your mind is your brain, like they said in the case of Phineas Gage. Such thinking expects us to jettison the notion of freedom and personal responsibility. It identifies us with a piece of matter that subjects us to the laws of material nature. Our lives become predestined. Free will is an illusion, and determinism is the order of the day. That's biologism. Okay? Now, there's a beautiful section in, in, in this book, The Brain and the Inner World, written by Mark Soames, our very own Mark Soames, who wrote a book recently with George Ellis, and Oliver Turnbull, who's also South African. And on page 45, he says, the brain has a special, mysterious property that distinguishes it from all other organs. Are you listening to me? Because I tried to read to my children and they wouldn't have it, so you'll have to listen to me. It is the seat of the mind somehow producing our feeling of being ourselves in the world right now. Trying to understand how this happens, how matter becomes mind, is the mind-body problem. And it started in the 17th century with Descartes' uh, Descartes' uh, statement. But now, you know, if you believe that there is a brain and a mind, you call the dualist. If you feel that brain and mind are one and the same, you call it a monist. But he has a beautiful section on what he calls dual aspect monism. He says, this accepts that we are made of only one type of stuff. That is why it is a monist position. But it also suggests that this stuff is perceived in two different ways. Hence, dual aspect monism. As we understand it, it implies that the brain is made of stuff that appears physical when viewed from the outside as an object and mental when viewed from the inside as a subject. When I perceive myself externally in the mirror, for example, and internally through introspection, I am perceiving the same thing in two different ways as a body and a mind respectively. This distinction between body and mind is therefore an artifact of perception. My external perceptual apparatus sees me, that means my body, as a physical entity, and my internal perceptual apparatus feels me, myself, as a mental entity. And what he goes on to say is this has now become a philosophical problem, and it's not worth actually having too many sleepless nights over. So you can look at it either way. You can say that they're two separate things or they're one thing. And you can still go on and understand how the brain works. So he's, Thales says that biologism leads to determinism. The notion that we do not determine anything, but are ourselves determined by things outside of us. Every one of our actions is a physical event, which has a cause, which in turn has causes, to go all the way to before we were born, so nothing can be done about it. That's what determinism says. We are not free. If I am identical to my brain, then there is no distinction between me writing about Caesars as when I myself am in the grip of a Caesar. In modern neuroscientific terms, they are the same thing. Conscious agency does not exist. The unconscious mind determines all. You think you have free will. That's an illusion. My brain made me do it. And that's what happened in a court one day in New York when somebody was being charged for rape and he said to the judge, my brain made me do it. I'm designed that way. Okay. So, Callis agrees that neuroscience and evolution, these are two of humanity's amazing achievements. It is a bitter irony that they are used to prop up a picture of humanity that is not only wrong, but degrading. Science is one of the pinnacles of our culture. 
The problem is with scientism, not science. The mistaken belief that the natural sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, and the derivatives can or will give a complete description and even explanation of everything, including human life. He says it can't. There, there are people who would disagree with that. So he gives us some examples of neuromania from neuroscience, a claim that neurobiology can account for everything, altruism, empathy, racial bias, trust, wisdom, very much like Francis Crick's ideas of brain and mind. You remember we mentioned Francis Crick? Crick and Watson, who discovered the DNA, structure of DNA. So, 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 so Crick wrote a book in the 90s, The Astonishing Hypothesis, The Scientific Search for the Soul. And he said, you are your brain. Neurosciences have turned their gaze inwards. Anatomy, physiology, feelings and emotions, uh, and, and Crick's book became The Watershed. And in it he said, you, your joys and sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Enough to make you feel very lonely in this universe, that you are just a whole lot of chemical reactions. And then Tellus goes to say, if you take things like the latest information that brain scans are giving us love, about love, beauty, wisdom, scans show more activity in the orbitofrontal cortex in subjects looking at beautiful pictures. Okay? For example, an fMRI scan does not directly tap into brain activity. It registers indirectly by detecting an increase in blood flow to busy neurons. Now they do these tests. They give you a picture of a loved one, and you smile and say, that's my daughter, and they take a scan, and they determine exactly in which part of the brain, to which part of the brain, the blood flow is increasing. A loving relationship, Tallis says, is too complex to be analyzed by an MRI. A picture of the face of a loved one is too transient to measure what one feels. I mean, there's a history in that relationship. Scans overlook the networked or distributed nature of the brain's workings. They emphasize localized activity instead of communication between different regions of the brain. Okay? And then there are some neuroscientists who say, and I'm putting this very, very crudely, very simply, that if you took an individual, Mr. Smith, whom you know, and took out his entire nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, all his peripheral nerves beautifully dissected and taken out and put in a vat in which you poured all the nutrients which the brain usually has through the blood supply right in your body. Will that brain, would, will that brain call itself Mr. Smith? If the brain in the vat concept was true, then the world would be a mere construct of nerve impulses. That's what Teller says. Okay, so neuromania, I am enraged, right? And he says to the pure materialists, he says, metaphysics cannot be taken out of humanity. Brains are not computers with just pro which just process information like computers do. Brains support the existence of a person in a world of meaning and value. Evolutionary psychology, and he's talking about the pinkers of the world, has grossly underestimated the difference between us and animals. Evolution has taken us much further away from our animal relatives than we are told. You're not, you are not your brain, says Tallis, a rejection of the neurodeterminism of the evolutionary psychologist. So he rejects that. So what I'm also trying to point out is, in trying to answer this question in what it means to be human, there's a huge disagreement amongst or within the scientific community itself. It's not homogeneous. There's no consensus on these issues. It's all based on evidence and painstaking work. Okay? So, the, so, so Tallis had an interview with Andrew Brown in The Guardian. And he told Andrew Brown that there is a distinction between the social and biological aspects of medicine. Medical knowledge accumulated by treating human beings as complex machinery 
or as just animals, saying that we belong to the animal kingdom. But the purpose of this knowledge is to treat people who cannot be reduced to biology. The science, the art, the humanity of medicine is a supreme expression of the distance of humans from their biology. Medicine may progress by analyzing the brain. Philosophers need to explain the mind, a completely different thing altogether. I've got a question mark there. Despite its dependency on a well-functioning brain. Okay. And then he said to Nicholas Fern in another interview um, on beauty, he says, I'm not sure that beauty has any correlation with neural activity. Now, this is a very controversial statement. Sodium ions going through flea-bitten membranes, is that what we, beauty is about? What he's referring to is that while, while you're listening to me and you're receiving, uh, you're hearing my voice through your ears or you're looking at me through your eyes, right? So that information, right, that comes in as, as light is actually transformed into a nerve impulse in our auditory nerve or in our optic nerves. We then carry them to a certain part of the brain. But there's no picture inside your head of me. All that's happening is action, action potentials in your nerves which, in which impulses are transmitted. Now, what Talis is saying is, if you look at these nerves and you look at this action potential, which is actually the exchange of sodium and potassium ions across the membranes to actually propel that impulse, okay? That's the information. The information of you has been converted in my brain into an impulse. So he says if you look inside the brain, there's no picture. But the picture comes because we embody it. It's more than just material things. That's what he's trying to say. Okay? Now, this is a bit long, but this tells you about Talis' thinking. Um, are we governed by unconscious processes? Neuroscience believes so. But isn't the human condition more complicated than that? Now, two experts do, uh, offer different views. So, this is David Eagleman. He's a neuroscientist at Stanford. And he says, we depend on the brain's integrity to understand our thoughts, hopes, fears. A tumor, stroke, or drugs change the brain, and we see the world differently. Therefore, the body and mind are not separable. You are your brain. Just like the Phineas Gage situation. This is what David Eagleman says. Of course, Talis says no. We are a community of minds, and we are participants in that community. Trying to understand the community of minds through a single brain, this is, I think, the, the crux of the argument. Trying to understand the community of minds through a single brain is like trying to understand the whispering of the woods by applying a stethoscope to an acorn. Okay? So Eagleman comes back and he says, it is known that our consciousness is a small part of a largely unconscious brain. A person is built of contradictory parts, and to understand ourselves, we have to study neural tissue. Right? So Talis says, of course, brain activity is automated and unconscious, but we are not automatons. We choose our spouses, buy our favorite newspaper, and you, Dr. Eagleman, are sufficiently aware or conscious of our unawareness of the unconscious sufficiently to be able to write a book about it. So in summary, Raymond Talis is arguing for free will and agency. We are not zombies. Consciousness is large enough for our free will and agency, and our lives and choices need not be guided from the dark unconscious. Now let me tell you, these are statements that are being made by different people in the field, and they're in disagreement, but this is not the final word. I'm not standing here and telling you that this is Talis's words are the final words. This is a work in progress. Okay? So Darwinitis. Instead of Darwin, he says, if any ideas are important, then ideas of the kind of creatures we are must be of supreme importance. As an atheist and a humanist, I believe that we should develop an image of humanity that is richer and truer to our distinctive nature than that of an exceptionally gifted chimp. It is not an advance to escape from false 
supernatural thought only to land in a prison of a naturalistic understanding. Okay. So now, the human world is a community of mind. It's populated by individuals and societies, not just organisms. Humans share a public sphere, structured and underpinned by an infinity of abstractions, generalizations, customs, practices, laws, institutions, facts and artifacts unknown even to the most social of animals. It is in this common space that, that as cells that actively and knowingly lead lives in conjunction with other cells, our human destinies are played out. Now, let's go back to Darwin's ideas and try to determine what shaped Thales's thinking and where he diverted from mainstream thinking. Now, this is my interpretation. You can disagree with it. So, the construction of Thales's argument for humanness, he makes it clear. He says, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is absolutely impeccable the greatest idea that humanity has ever entertained. In fact, in his book, he says, Darwin would beat Shakespeare, and then he mentioned a few big names. He says, Darwin's theory is absolutely fabulous. Humans came into being through the operation of non-random natural selection on random variation. I don't want to go into, uh, deeply into, into the principles of evolution, but I think you have an idea. And this is all borne out by modern genetics, the great synthesis that took place in the 20th century. Now, does evolution need a designer? This is the question, which calls for a squig of water. Are you with me? OK. Natural selection needs no designer. It has no noble goal. Now, this is the, 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 the thing as it stands. Natural selection needs no designer. It has no noble goal purpose, destination, or crowning glory. It is a mindless, unconscious, and pointless process. It has no plans for the future. It has no mind or mind's eye. So essentially, when I showed you that chart, if you saw those lower animals, nobody came along and said, well, now we should move further and carry on and come to human beings. That's not how natural selection works. It works for immediate adaptation. Right? Now, Dawkins wrote a book uh, a while of, uh, back, and it was a rebuttal to the 18th century theologian William Paley. It was called The Blind Watchmaker. Okay? Now, this book, The Blind Watchmaker, what Dawkins says is that William Paley argued that if you are walking along the moor and you find a watch, or something complex, and you pick it up and you look at it and you say, who designed this? It's so complex. I mean, what, what, what purpose does it serve and what was the designer thinking when he or she designed this? Okay? Now, the designer, according to Dawkins, is, are the blind forces of physics. Now, we're talking about the designer of life, not of that watch. Okay? Now, the philosophical implications of the blind watchmaker, that Darwin has pitchforked mind out of the universe. Is that true? Yes, he has. The birth of the universe is a physical process and not based on a word, idea, or intelligence. While the universe developed through cause and effect, there is no original cause of its origin. The universe is the cause of itself. Even Spinoza, I think, said that. Right. Now, what um, Thales says in his book, and this is where he parts with Darwin and Dawkins, mind is not banished from the universe. Human beings have minds, and they cover this earth, at least, with their artifacts, including watches. Okay? Now, they, I, 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 I sort of, I battled with this, and I'll tell you soon why. Now, I want you to consider that 13.6 billion years ago, the universe was born from a singularity as a Big Bang. And then a little later you had, I mean, since then you had hot temperatures, and a little later you had wildly moving atoms. The blind forces of physics were the order of the day. Life arose 4 billion years ago by evolution. So that's quite a difference in time, from 13.6 billion years to 4 billion years ago, by evolution, 
a purposeless, mindless, unintentional process with no goal in mind, according to Dawkins. And yet blind forces produced cognitively sighted humans who are now able to see, identify, and comment on the blind forces of physics. Sorry. Even to, oh no. Okay, so even to notice that they are blind and deliberately utilize them to engage with nature as if from the outside and on much more favorable terms. Why does the world exist? Because we were going to be here one day to appreciate and marvel at it. We humans are the sighted watchmakers. So that is a, quite a difference in opinion. Okay, so Darwinism has fallen short of accounting for the sighted watchmaker, and that's you and me. If there are no sighted watchmakers in nature, and humans are sighted watchmakers in the narrower sense of making artifacts whose purpose they envisage in advance, and in the wider sense of consciously aiming at stated goals, then humans are not part of nature, or not entirely so. It's a very problematic remark. He has given humans a special godlike place in nature. Has he not gone back to the creationist scriptural view of man on the top? That was my question. To deny this is Darwinitis, he says. And this is where I think Talus went wrong. Consciousness, meaning, purpose, culture, and morality are all natural products of evolutionary bio biological processes, according to Dennett. Now that's the other view. Daniel Dennett is a philosopher. So, how did we come to be so different? We have an enormously complex and sustained self-consciousness, unmatched by any other creature. Okay? I was having a discussion with somebody, I said consciousness has different phases. You're conscious of something on the outside, but then you also become conscious of your inside, and then you're conscious of the facts that you are conscious. So, what are the factors that made us human and different? We talk of brain size in relation to body size. We talk of a larger frontal cortex than seen in the great apes. We say we have language. We say we have bipedalism. Are these the things that really work towards making us human? Okay. According to Raymond Tallis, the thumb enables us to hitch a ride on the laws of nature to destinations that nature had not prefigured. He says when the forest gave way to the savanna, Apes be became upright, bipedalism. The upright position liberated the hand. The ancestor could now survey the scene and be safer. They could point in the direction of food and danger. The hand made the ape uniquely aware of its own actively engaged body. So that's the beginnings of consciousness. I am this body, the birth of the self. The opposable thumb, the hand became a proto-tool, enriched with a huge nerve supply. They became conscious of the hand, and that gave the birth of civilizations millions of years later. Okay, now here is a diagram of a human hand, a chimpanzee's hand. You can see the thumb is much larger here, and I think the digits are all much freer. And then the hand of Australopithecus sediba that was uh, discovered by Lee Berger. Um, so in this hand you can see that it's, it's almost, well it's almost, I think that's why Lee Berger, one of the arguments he made is that he, this should be classified as homo because of this. Sorry? Oh, it, 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 it's a fossil, it's one of our, I spoke about it yesterday. It's one of our ancestors, but they were Australopithecines, of the genus Australopithecine. You remember we spoke about Raymond Dart's Australopithecus africanus? So this is of the same genus, and it was found very recently by Lee Berger in a cave in, I think it was uh, Makapanskat, or somewhere in, in that area, in the cradle of humankind. We, we here don't believe that the human hand, the proportions are completely wrong. It is wrong, yeah. yeah. The, the one in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Sorry? Yeah. And, and don't you think the thumb, the thumb is... Uh, what I was looking for is that in the ape you had 
a sort of webbed kind of thing without movement of, digit, of digits like we have. That's why we have this extraordinary prototool. I didn't. But I must check that out, George. Thanks for that. Right. Now, where are we? So, so Lee Berger Witz in 2008 described the first Australopithecus cerebra. It was a fossilized jawbone and collarbone belonging to a juvenile male hominem. We were found outside Malapa Cave in the Transvaal area of South Africa. This find led to the recovery of two partial hominem skeletons, a juvenile associated with a cranium and an adult female with a nearly complete arm and hand. The age of both specimens was estimated to be between 1.8 and 2 million years old, which is about the age of other Australopithecines. Using the size of the remains to estimate height, the male was thought to have stood approximately 1.3 meters tall. The female was taller. Okay. So here's some reconstructions. Now, Martin Meredith, talking about our ancestry, says modern apes have long arms, hands, and palms, and fingers, but short thumbs and arm swing from branch to branch. They walk on their knuckles. Australopithecines were bipedal. They had a long opposable thumb, relatively short palms and fingers. They could, they could use tools and they could make tools. The combination of this hand and larger complex brain enabled humans to develop into the only advanced culture on Earth. Okay? So Darwin's theory of evolution is true, but the distance evolution has taken us is much greater than is commonly allowed, says Raymond Tallis. Darwinism, not Darwinitis, gives an impressive account of the organism Homo sapiens and how it came into being. But then humans woke up from being organisms to being embodied subjects, self-aware and other-aware, to a degree not approachable by other animals. The human world is materially rooted in the natural world, but is quite different from it. So the debate now is, do we have free will? That's a huge debate. This universe from its very beginning is a physical phenomenon. Even living organisms, unicellular and multicellular, including humans, have been put together by physical processes using non-living macromolecules, proteins, lipids, whatever. Life emerged from non-life. Did intentionality, self-consciousness, agency, all emerge from these historical processes? And free will? Yes, say some. No, say others. There's a man by the name of Libet whose experiments show that physiological processes precede intentionality when we think we're making choices. So they say there's no free will. The decision was made for you already before you actually showed your intention or your choice. We, despite our complex design, are restricted by laws of nature. So Samuel Johnson says all theory is against the freedom of the will. All experience is for it, okay? And then, so where does the truth lie? Do we come to truth about free will through a rational discourse? Or do we say that free will does not exist because of the argument from the materialists? So that makes the truth of this matter Darwinian, an evolutionary truth. Anti-free will people say free will is an illusion. Where does the illusion come from? But it's a necessary illusion, like the self or like religion, some say, because it serves a Darwinian purpose. It acts as a cohesive factor for groups or societies promoting survival, reproduction, and the spreading of genes. This is what Tallis refers to as modern-day Darwinitis. Okay? Now, there is one principle I'd just like to talk to you about that mentioned by Stephen Hawking, the anthropic principle. And there's two versions of it in his book. One is the weak version. In a universe that is large or infinite in space and or time, the conditions necessary for the development of intelligent life will only be met in certain regions that are limited in space and time, like the Earth. We, intelligent beings, know that the Earth satisfies the conditions necessary for the existence of life. And the strong version says there are many different universes or many different regions of a single universe, each with its own initial configuration and own set of laws of science. So we humans then ask, why is the universe the way we see it? Answer, 
if it had been different, we would not have been here. Or the universe exists because there was one day going to be conscious life that would come into being to appreciate this universe. Okay, Thomas Nagel, philosopher, who wrote Mind and Cosmos in 2012, says, the world is an, is an astonishing place. That it has produced you and me and the rest of us is even more astonishing about it. The idea that we have in our possession, the basic tools needed to understand it, is no more credible now than it was in Aristotle's days. It is the task of philosophy to investigate the limits of even the best developed and most successful forms of knowledge. We are addicted to the hope of final reckoning, but intellectual humility demands that we resist thinking that we have the tools to understand the whole universe. Recognizing our limits could lead to new forms of scientific understanding. Now his main thesis is that the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature, nature is almost certainly false. The existence of consciousness is both one of the most familiar and one of the most outstanding things about the world. If physical science, whatever it may have to say about life's origin, leaves us in the dark about consciousness, then it cannot provide the basic form of intelligibility for this world. And this was all dedicated to my cat. Thank you very much. <laughs> George, you want to say anything? Comments? You want to say anything? Yeah. Okay, can we go back to the slides about the universe? Uh, the hand. Sorry? About the hand. About the universe, you had two slides about the universe. Did I? Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's go back. Oh, you mean that 13.6 billion years ago? Oh, yeah? Yeah. Let me make it big. Yeah. What, what's it? Which one, bro? Evolution could only take place once life existed. Right. Origin of life is not due to evolution, but evolution only begins to operate once there is life. Life. Okay. Um, what? Yeah. Sorry, does the, does the universe not evolve from all the... Yeah, that, that, that's, another way of, that's another way of looking at it, that from the Big Bang onwards, there was an evolution. It was not of life, but it was an evolution of the universe. The evolution of the universe is different. Is sure, sure, sure. There's no natural selection. No. Yeah. But George, can I just remind you that in the selfish gene, Dawkins says that there appeared on, on Earth at some time a molecule that could make a copy of itself, right? Well, actually, the effect of the matter is we don't know how life began. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but that's his speculation, and that's what I showed in the first lecture. But he says there was a lot of probably faults and a lot of corrections to be made. So there was a form of natural selection there until you had a better DNA or whatever. Okay, can we go down one? So you want me to go further? Um, no? Can you go back now to the quick quote when you had the quick quote? Oh, yeah, yeah, the quick quote, yeah. Here we are. Nerve cells and their associated molecules do nothing. 
That's right. But he's not a physicist. Remember, he knows nothing about physics. <laughs> he's a biologist. Yeah, but thanks for that, George. That, that, that was helpful. Uh, you read this book, this Crick's book. Yeah. Oh, okay. More, more discussion. <laughs> Nobody? Mr. Kaji, you happy about mind and brain? Described by Newton's laws, but when you say not aimlessly, uh, yeah, are you trying to give them a human characteristic? Yeah, yeah. Is it is there a purpose? Sorry, I'm coming to you. You had your hand up. Um, I just wondered whether we could define consciousness a bit more. We're using this word consciousness. Yeah. And I, I, um, I'm also wondering where uh, the I or the it or the personal experience comes into what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. That's a tough one, eh, George? Consciousness. A form of awareness. You're conscious of the world outside and you're conscious of or you're aware of things that are happening inside. Yeah, not as complex and fully developed as the human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not with, not, probably not, what you're saying is not with the concept of a self. A dog wouldn't say, think of itself in a way that you think of yourself. Yeah, that's fair enough. But to, you know, to give you a definition, they are, definitions but they're quite problematic. We, we're going to do it tomorrow and we're going to try and talk about it but it, it's a difficult one. Yeah. Yes sir? When I was five years old I tried to understand the notion of infinity of space and the infinity of time and I realized after six months of keeping myself awake that I couldn't do so and so I decided to accept the beauty of life the smell of women, the taste of peaches, the living in this most beautiful of all cities, and the clement climate. And then to, 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 to want to understand it all would be that I'm looking a gift horse in the mark. I don't know how to comment on that. <laughs> but, but I'll just accept the fact that you've made a very profound statement. Anybody else? Do not know 